If there has been a dominant influence around politics in 2011, it would be, as usual, money. Debt ceilings, revenue streams, the 99%, budget showdowns, the super committee. All of these stories revolve around how the government acquires and then spends your money. So how does our tax system work? What changes are likely for the future? And more abstractly, what constitutes a fair tax system? We answer these questions today on The Professors. From across the city and the seven city colleges of Chicago, broadcasting from 63rd and Halsted at Kennedy King College, professors take the art of conversation to a higher degree. I'm Ted Williams from Kennedy King College. Joining me today are professors Pamela Canmaray from Kennedy King College, Nick Panamitros from UIC, Harper and Kennedy King College, and C.M. Winters Palacio from Malcolm X College. Before we begin this episode of The Professors, let's watch a student-produced video segment on taxes and fairness. As Mark Twain was fond of saying, the only two certainties in life are death and taxes. Controversy over taxes is nothing new. The beginnings of this country can be traced back to the famous Boston Tea Party of 1773, which played a key role in the growth of the American Revolution. The slogan then was no taxation without representation. During a recent informal survey of shoppers and store owners on the city's south side, we found the new slogan these days sound more like tax the rich and help the poor. The thing I would do is I would uh, devise a system where everybody would have to pay their fair share. For the rich people, I think they have to increase you know, the tax and on the other hand, they have to reduce the tax for the poor people. I know it's cliche to say tax the wealthy and, and give a tax break to the poor or the middle class, but it seems like that would work better since they do have all the money. Stop taking the money from the poor people, you know. Uh, stop taxing the people who already have money, they already set for life. I would definitely consider increasing the taxes on the wealthy, uh, ones that make over a million dollars or more. The people we surveyed also expressed concerns about the impact federal and local taxes have on small business owners who are struggling in this economy. Now they have to help us out in some type of way to just let it run for a good about a month or two and once everything go come in you know control and then you know they can get the money and stuff that they want you know. Small business owners make up what 70 percent of our economy the biggest part of the market so job market so that's who we should tax. We should tax the richer people, not the poor people. Because um, China seems to have a lot more leeway in reference to you know, what, how they conduct their businesses out there. But in the United States, it seems like um, a lot of companies can't really compete. Most Americans would agree the federal tax system is confusing. All that paperwork, and what does it all mean? One person thinks more needs to be done to inform and educate people about how the American economic system operates. I think there should be more classes taught at an earlier age in, in um, school so people can know about their uh, federal taxes, about you know income, just about period, about you know uh, economics. Reporting for the professors on WYCC TV, I'm Lenise Brown. All right, today we are talking about the fair taxes. So what I want to uh, begin our conversation with today is a little bit about sort of the history of this question, where the U.S. stands in terms of taxes, because as we saw in the segment, there is really a perception that uh, the United States, we don't tax sort of the wealthy enough. Now, uh, prior to 1913, there were no federal taxes. Uh, and so, but when we look at the United States, we uh, have consistently uh, spent, we continue to spend more and more uh, federal spending uh, as a percentage of GDP has just kind of gone through the roof. We spend a lot of money on a variety of programs and we need more money to pay for these programs. So I want to begin the conversation today with talking about overall these general questions about the U.S. tax system in terms of its fairness, uh, its history, that sort of thing. So who wants to hop in first? <laughs> I'll start. Sure. I'll start. The, the way our tax system seems to be set up now is the progressive tax system. And what that means <clears throat> is that the the rich people really are being taxed more based on their income so that there's less of a burden on the poor people. And as I, I looked up the definition 
uh, of what is our progressive tax system. It is an increased tax to distribute high tax burdens on individuals with high households with incomes that are um, more substantial. And so because it's personal and it's a progressive tax on household income, the tax rates increase as income increases. Sure. Now there's some pros and cons to that, of course. And so the, of, of course the biggest advantage is that wealthier individuals, of course, would pay higher taxes and it relieves the burden off of individuals who cannot pay Yeah, the and, and there, in, our, in our system there seems to be a, a fundamental belief that that makes make sense. Uh, you know, we all heard the story of Warren Buffett. But, you know, we also have sort of a number of people who are talking about, well, maybe that's not so fair. Uh, one of the uh, things that we've discussed recently uh, is this organization called the Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, and um, uh, this guy, uh, Grover Nor Norquist, basically, who is, who is arguing that, uh, that we should not have any taxation uh, uh, raised, raise, any taxes raised at all. So he's gotten politicians mm -hmm. to sign a pledge, the vast majority of Republican politicians to sign a pledge he will not raise taxes. So does that, I mean, politically, nobody wants to be taxed. That's the bottom line. The wealthy don't want to be taxed heavily. The poor don't want to be taxed heavily. And yet we have this growing uh, government. Uh, we have more programs, Social Security, uh, welfare, defense spending. Uh, we'll talk about those budgetary num numbers in a moment. But what's going on? I don't know. I mean, I'm by far, I am, I think I am perhaps typical of most mm -hmm. Americans. I, it is utterly confusing, but I think I would, I would take pause with the observation that no one wants to pay taxes. I don't, I don't think that, um, I don't mind paying the taxes. It's what's, gonna, what's happening with my money. And so, no, I don't want to pay taxes if I'm funding research about can bacon grow on Mars? No, I don't want my taxes to go for that. But if my taxes are concrete going, concretely going towards, you know, my neighbor who's having a rough time, and so there's there's some sure. help there for them, then I think that's that's all fair. I'm actually stuck on that question because okay. they just said that uh, the uh, sp the spacecraft uh, to Mars. Uh -huh. I didn't know that the bacon thing was no. Be a part I, I of just the, made uh, that okay. up. I, I, but, I, I mean, but maybe hey, but see more. now somebody's got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nick. Why don't you go ahead? Well, I think that we have to look at <clears throat> uh, what, what Pamela was talking about, but uh, take into consideration, you know, the United States is uh, a hege hegemonous being in mm -hmm. this uh, world right now, and our military spending, our defense budget's, you know, almost a half a trillion dollars. Uh, overseas contingency operations are $120 billion. Uh, State Department, Homeland Security, Veteran Affairs, you know, it comes out almost to be a trillion dollars a year. Um, the fact of the matter is, I think uh, the United States, America has to decide, you know, do we want to be the uh, protector of the world? I mean, there is no more uh, Soviet Union, and we've sort of assumed this role. Sure. Uh, and it's costing us a lot of money. I'm sure there are some benefits yeah. that come back via corporations, uh, via policy, <clears throat> via um, uh, our system or our way of living, which comes back to help us. But at the end of the day, you know, you're talking about a trillion dollars. Yeah, but Nick, but 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 here's the reality. I have to I have to speak for the you know the the the, the pro military uh, contingency, if you will, because military is not the only major expenditure we have. I mean, if you look at Social Security, if you look at health care expenses like Medicare. Um, the uh, children's insurance programs that are, are around the country, those things, you put those together, Medicare, Medicaid, you take Social Security, and then you put defense there, that's literally 60% of our budget right there with those, those programs. And so, yes, defense is huge, but we could make a lot of cuts outside of defense, not that I'm saying that we should, but I think that, you know, depending on the political persuasion we're coming from, some blame defense, some blame Social Security, and, and Medicare and Medicaid, and I would say, yo, there are a lot of things that we need to cut if we're going to really start talking about reducing the budget. But well, that's Ted, Ted, just, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, if you look at the um, post of uh, Soviet uh, Cold War era, um, you saw a lot of the uh, upswing in our economy due to military sure. uh, spending cuts. Sure. And that's what created a lot of the euphoria of the 90s, which 
sort of led to this problem that we're in right now because of uh, all this extra money and cash around. So, you know, I beg to differ. You, you look at many other countries, mm -hmm. European countries that don't have, or other countries around the world that don't have such a uh, huge expenditure on uh, military spending. Mm -hmm. You see a lot of better things happening there. Yeah, but they also, you know, and I, I, I make the, the argument not, once again, necessarily that I'm saying that we need to stop spending, but, you know, the, the Republicans are going to argue, yeah, but look at Europe and their social, uh, their social programs that cost billions of dollars, and look at how many of their economies are struggling under the weight of that. And so that would be an argument that's made as well. My point fundamentally is that the federal government, we spend a lot of money, period. And we've got to figure out ways to either increase revenue or cut the spending because I, I think what we're doing is completely unsustainable at the end of the day. And I think that honestly, you know, Europe may be somewhat of a model, but many would argue that it's not. Well, I, I don't. What I was going to share is that I don't think that it's a clear-cut issue. I, mm -hmm. I do agree with you, Ted, that we do have to decrease spending in some areas, but there's so much overlap, and everything is pretty much interconnected. I don't know if you can separate out. Um, a, a very complicated issue as as taxes because you you have your local then your state then your federal and then it, it all seems to be intertwined and and not only that we haven't even talked about the unemployed where you have people who were contributing persons mm -hmm. in society who worked a job were taxed and now you have successful people between <clears throat> opportunities who cannot contribute to that. Then we have the other issue of immigrants. We didn't even talk about that, where you have them using our resources and they're not, they're under the radar of the tax system. And so they're seemingly depleting what Americans have uh, as, as a source of resources. Sure. Uh, then you, you is the homeless. I mean, there are just so many entities out there that to try to separate out and says, well, let's take from here and add over here and cushion that. That I don't know if you can just do that. But when I'm at home and I'm watching TV and I swear to God, I'm trying to make sense of it. I, I, I still come up feeling like I am the one who's being asked to give at the office again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just I understand when you talk about the the, the proportion of how the wealthy truly are paying um, their what fair share of taxes mm -hmm. per se, but there are so many other tax breaks and so many other write-offs that they get that are just not comparable. I mean, you, you read about, um, oh, I can't think of the, the gentleman's name. Uh, he got this like a $15 million tax write-off because he took his personal art collection and donated it to his nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's infuriating. Sure. Let me throw out a, a few uh, statistics here and some thoughts uh, on the U.S. tax system. So uh, President Obama recently said that if you're a wealthy CEO or hedge fund, uh, hedge, a hedge fund manager in America right now, your taxes are lower than they've ever been, and they're lower than they've been since the 1950s. United States among uh, OECD nations, with the or which is the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development, uh, we have one of the lowest tax rates of all of these countries. Uh, only Mexico, Turkey, Korea, and Japan have lower, lower tax rates. We also have this um, situation where uh, the United States has uh, a very high, actually, corporate tax rate. We have the second highest corporate tax rate to Japan in the world. But we have a plethora of corporate loopholes that make it so that the corporations don't actually pay that. And it's estimated through the President's Jobs Act recently that if we closed just the loopholes for the oil companies, that we would yield $45 billion in additional revenue. So we think about all of this. And you know, once again, I, I, I throw this out as conversation, as, as fodder for conversation, because you know, I, um, I'll throw my opinion in a little bit later. But, uh, we look at all this and we say, well, fundamentally, well, shouldn't we just raise taxes and wouldn't everything be okay? Shouldn't we close the corporate loopholes? We should raise taxes uh, on folks, individuals, et cetera. Uh, and that, you know, wouldn't raising taxes end this problem that we have? Ted, if you, mm -hmm. if you uh, close those loopholes for those corporations, uh, the United States is a haven for corporations. Sure. And, you know, we talk many times about the, you know, a lot of the bads and evils of corporations, but if they weren't here, if they all flee and decide to go to another country, which gives them more favorable mm -hmm. uh, status uh, uh, tax-wise, then we won't have the, the evil here, but we also won't collect any of the revenues that sure. these corporations uh, uh, have. And not only that, um, a lot of the security that they provide, because a lot of these corporations, you know, oil, 
uh, technology stuff. We would rather have them here in the United States than have them somewhere else. You know, so I uh, I agree with you that uh, it would be nice to perhaps close those loopholes, mm -hmm. but is it a reality? Is it something sure. you could really do? Well, but not only that, I mean, just in the headlines today, Sears mm -hmm. and CME yeah. Group yeah. have been courted yeah. to stay in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. yeah. just so that they would not leave, because if that company leaves, here you have more jobs, yeah, more people, are, yeah. right, exactly, yeah. more people that are may, yeah. being paid on payroll. Yeah. And so by giving the corporation mm -hmm. this state tax break, then that encourages them to stay within the state of Illinois mm -hmm. and not go to another state. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's but very you, But you know what's so interesting about that as we talk about it? The reality is, is that even though uh, we, you know, we're having the conversation about corporate taxes, mm -hmm. the reality is, is that the states re rely primarily on income taxes to fund the state government. And so when you look at the U.S. compared with all these other nations, while fundamentally overall we don't tax as much, we rely more heavily on income taxes in most of these nations, and we rely less on consum consumption taxes. And so maybe the question is not necessarily how much we're taxing, but maybe even we could talk about what kinds of taxes. Because the reality is, and I know for a fact that there is a, uh, a very uh, uh, aggressive movement now to question the constitutionality of the income tax. tax. Uh -huh. Uh, and, and many people, if you find, you know, if, if you looked at all the taxes to find which are the least popular, I would imagine the income tax is probably the, the least popular of all. And, and so and maybe we should talk about that. But, well, but. second to that, I think, would be the inheritance tax. Sure, yeah. Your family saved all their life to leave you this inheritance, and they give you this nice big sum of money, and then all of a sudden, now you're taxed on it because you inherited it. I just, um, a, a couple of years ago, I opened a bank account, and they said, if you open this bank account, we will give you $100. And I was like, oh, yippee, $100. So I open this account, I get this nice, crisp $100 bill, mm -hmm. and next thing I know, tax time rolls around, I get a letter saying, as a result of that $100 you received, you now owe taxes on mm. it. Mm. And I was just so much shocked. The, do you remember how much of the $100 was? <laughs> I don't remember. Okay. But it's just interesting sure, it is. that everything it seems is. to be taxed. It is. It is. It is. There's no escaping yeah. it. So what do we do? I mean, you know, we, 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 I mean, we fundamentally, and I, I think that, you know, the, the thing I like about the show that we do, mm -hmm. okay, I have to give a plug for our own <laughs> show, okay? I, I like the fact that we don't, always represent the clear partisan arguments. So if this you know, were a different show, you'd have one person on one side saying, hey, well, you know, we have to have less taxes. The other person arguing, we have to have more taxes. And I think here we have the freedom to, I think, look at these issues from a variety of perspectives. So all political arguments aside, how do we fundamentally deal with the idea that we have you know, rising health care costs, we have a, a growing population, uh, we have uh, all of these uh, commitments around the world, and yet we don't necessarily uh, want to raise new ways to pay for these things. I think, I, I think we have to really, sometimes I just wonder, you know, can we just reprioritize our spending? Okay. You know, that's true, a lot is going towards the military, but just imagine of all the other things that could have done with half of that money. Mm -hmm. And, and so I wonder if when we're having that conversation about, you know, what's the appropriate percentage of taxes, there needs to be a, the, the, another conversation that's going on, perhaps even almost simultaneously, is to say, okay, and this is how we're going to change the way we spend mm -hmm. this money as well. It's kind of like running your own personal, your own home. It does no good to, to say, okay, we're going to come up with a new budget and we're going to create a new saving plan, but we're still spending. We still have the same spending habits. Sure. And I think that's what's problematic. So I think I would be more apt to pay attention to a conversation that says, this is what, these are some of the proposals. This is what the tax plan will look like. And then this is how we're going to change our spending. But at the end of the day, I, you know, I, I really want to see a lot of the, the millionaires who are hitting the microphone to, to also do their fair share. Okay. I, I, I really would like to see that because it, just, it does, you know, I, you know, you don't want to sound like a three-year-old, but it just, it just looks so freaking unfair. Okay. That, that's okay. what I feel. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> we need to uh, look a little further out. We, uh, we're always looking for a quick fix mm -hmm. to the problem now, and we hold people accountable for a lot of times for uh, situations that are the result of something that was done 10, 15, 20 years ago. 
the economic crisis right now, you know, is something that was building up for over a decade. Yeah. And more than that, with the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac mm -hmm. uh, situation, and uh, their appeal of Glass Steagall and, and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Exactly. And I think Americans uh, need to uh, have these kind of discussions on their own, you know, at the, at, at the dinner table, and um, be kept abreast of what's going on. And I think look a little further out. Yeah, we need to fix a problem now, but mm -hmm. sometimes it's like taking medicine. You take your medicine, things are going to get uglier for a while before they get better. And there's never any discussion about it. And it seems as though the politics that gets involved, you know, I always say that there's three parties in this country. Mm -hmm. You know, people think it's the independent party, but it's the Democratic, Republican, and it's the incumbent party. Mm -hmm. You know, the incumbent party comes election times, you know, they all stick together because they want to be their next term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so what they go for is the quick fix, uh, what looks like it's a quick fix or fix for right now, but they don't, they don't handle the issue five or 10 or 15 years out. And that's why we have the problems we have right now with Medicare, you know, Medicaid and, and uh, all these different funds because we're only looking to the right now yeah. and not uh, further out. But can sure. I just add to that? I and mean, you know, it's funny you should say that, Nick, because um, when you talked about the politicians and the incumbents who are quick to jump onto a quick fix, I, I think about one time my husband and I we were watching the, on the news and we saw all these politicians, you know, all of them had their two cents to mm -hmm. say. And I said, you know, it'd be nice if, if some, if a politician would just stand up with a dry erase board and a marker and just from the audience pick people and say, this is what you make, this is how this is going to affect you. Mm -hmm. Just do the public math. There okay. just seems like there's so much discrete mathematics. At the end of the day, yeah, you are sitting there okay. confused and you do want the, look, just, just give me the five talking points and then I'll make a well, decision. Well, Sam, I'll give you three talking points. Nine, nine, and nine, right? Oh, stop. <laughs> okay. stop. Now, this, now, listen, now, you know, we, 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 we laugh about this. Now, now hey, I, I, I'm an equal opportunity offender and supporter. And I think that uh, Herman Cain's 999 plan, and, and God rest his campaign, which is now, you know, has been buried. It's been but suspended. 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 Okay, suspended, suspended. suspended right? Uh, which actually, last night I was watching uh, uh, him on TV, and they asked him to clarify that. He said, yeah, suspended means ended. That's what he said. Okay, but I'm so, still collecting right. money. <laughs> exactly. For right now, it's right. ended. But, but his, the simplicity of his tax plan resonated with people, and you cannot deny that. You cannot deny the idea of this, this flat tax. Uh, the 999 plan would be a flat tax on business, 9% uh, business, 9% consumption, 9% individual tax. That's kind of how it would work. And, and there's a simplicity in it that's not a progressive tax system. It's right. a completely flat system. And in that, Democrat or Republican, the simplicity of that plan resonates with people. But is this sustainable? <clears throat> I, I, I heard arguments well, well, that said yeah. that even though that sounds, it's, it, it has a great feeling, Sure, but it's, it's not sustainable. It, it may or may not be, but, it, but, but I think that it speaks to the heart of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. This is true. Uh, and that people feel like our tax code is too complicated. And you know, we've talked about how there are millions of Americans because of the complexity of the tax code and being able to find you know, loopholes, that sort of thing, that pay no taxes whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I'm in agreement with uh, with some of uh, what Sam was saying about the transparency mm -hmm. of not being able to see where the money is going, mm -hmm. and I think with with taxes you don't always see the transparency. And I like the idea of just having a whiteboard and just get up there yeah, and just, explain just, that. Just get Ross Perot one day, <laughs> okay. like here's a chalkboard. Right, yeah. exactly. To so explain that, but I also think that it, it pays to travel because when you do go to another country and mm -hmm. you come back to America, which is you know my home, then you do see the infrastructure. But the other thing is the waste. And I think we're a little mistrusting of the tax system or the lack of transparency because we do see waste. And unfortunately, now we've had two governors consecutively uh, sentenced because of wrongdoing in the political arena. And when you think in terms of how they, people in power misuse money, then I think that's a part of why people are sure. unhappy with sure. the with tax it, it system. It makes sense. Go ahead. If you, I agree. Uh, if you look at, say, uh, California, Governor uh, Jerry Brown is, is uh, doing something that's uh, a little bit different. He, mm -hmm. he needs to raise taxes over there, and he's collecting signatures to put, put it on the ballot, actually. Mm -hmm. And it looks like that uh, the taxpayers are in favor of it. Yeah. The problem is, is the trust. And I agree with Pamela that the um, <clears throat> people would be willing to contribute. But nobody knows where all this money gets squandered. 
and we're not saying all the money gets squandered, but a lot of it gets squandered. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, squandered on studying bacon on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> you know. But even when they pay, like when the when I often wonder what happens to the penalties. You know how the companies are always find these huge penalties. Uh, where does that money go? Well, here's actually let's let's just let's get very dirt real on this. Mm -hmm. uh, the Illinois Policy Institute puts out this this um, this budget every year. It's like the pork budget or whatever, and they go through all of these examples of the bacon and stuff like that. And, and those things are fun, and they make you know for good stuff on TV. But at the end of the day, you know what really we spend the most money on is people, personnel. The federal government is the largest employer in the United States, and so what happens is when you create programs and you create jobs you have a very difficult time ever ending those programs so the government does not exist to solve problems it exists to create sort of this you know this infrastructure that's going to last for years and years and so that fundamentally is a challenge and with a economy that's struggling i mean i have to tell you that uh... the government is a very great place to go if you want to have a stable job in this country well not, not right now, now. Well, now they're talking it, about closing post offices uh, yes but i would argue yes i agree with that i just would say compared to the private sector there's typically more stability in, in government employment mm -hmm. and that's really where money goes and any business owner knows that the vast majority of your money it's goes personnel, to personnel HR. Right. uh... you know so uh... Um, well, I mean, you gotta keep you gotta keep the country running so well yeah but i there are people that would argue that we could do it for less. And, and I guess, you know, we're going to wrap up here in a moment. So I'd like to take final thoughts. I'll throw mine in as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to, you know, this is a tough thing. You know, 30 minutes, we have 30 minutes, right? I don't know that we Solve can it. figure it out, in, it. right, in 30 minutes. I think we can offer. But if you were to uh, sort of encapsulate your thoughts here, uh, what would you suggest at the end of the day that we need to do going forward? And uh, why don't we start with you, Sam? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Like I said, I'm probably the person on the ground. Sure. I just like to see a little bit more clarity. Okay. I, it's kind of like going into a bad relationship and, you know, with the person. Like, just tell me the truth. But like, uh -huh. dude, you're really not capable of telling yeah. the truth. We can't handle the truth. We can't handle right? the truth. But just to be able, there's got to be someone out there that can help us understand. Because uh, I am totally confused and completely frustrated to the point that, you know, you don't want to cut your nose off to spite your face. But you're like, you know, dude, nobody gets anything. Yeah, I think, as I had said earlier, I just think people need to get more involved. We need to think further out. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to plan. We can't just uh, look at the right now. And uh, we have to consider all issues. A lot of times we look at our, you know, our immediate problems. But you know, I, I brought up uh, military because I thought it was just uh, mm -hmm. something that you could cut out if, mm -hmm. if we decided to take a different position uh, in the world. Uh, but you know, people don't consider that. They just look at, hey, cutting Medicare, Medicaid. And hey, what about what's going on with the uh, with the military? I'm not against the military, sure. but does America really want to keep that role as the as the uh, big patrol boy in the world? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's costing us a lot. Sure. And what are we getting back? Sure, Pamela. Mm -hmm. uh, I, of course, at this point, I have something <laughs> biblical to share uh, from Romans 13. And in Romans 13 in the Bible, it says that for the same reason you are to pay taxes for civil authorities and official servants under God. And because they devote themselves to attending the service, that we must render to men their dues. We must pay our taxes to whom taxes are due, revenue to whom revenue is due, and respect to whom respect is due. And so for this, God's servant is for your good. Cool. So, is that before uh, Jesus we, tore up uh, the temple? Oh, well, that's a whole other show. Okay. <laughs> that's a whole other show. But I think, you know, as we, as we close out here, I, you know, I'll offer a couple of thoughts on this as, as we close. You know, we are hitting a point where we are uh, approaching a $15 trillion mark in our debt. And at some point, uh, the level of spending without uh, figuring out a way to offset it with additional taxes or closing corporate loopholes, et cetera, uh, it's just unsustainable. And I was hopeful that this super committee was going to come up with some bipartisan solutions on this. Dude. It looks like the, uh, the political waters are, are still too, uh, too um, tumultuous, if you will, for that to happen. But if we don't get to that point, I think that we're going to face some very serious trouble in this country financially. And I do hope that we don't. So thank you, guys. This has been a wonderful uh, show. Uh, and uh, thank you all for watching.